Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gabor Mate. He is the author of four blockbuster books. One is called Scattered Minds, known in the United States as Scattered, A New Look at the Origins and Healing of Attention Disorder. Another book you may have heard of already called Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. And the book we're going to talk about today is When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress, Exploring the Stress-Disease Connection. And this is the latest book in the realm of hungry ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. He is a doctor who is exploring the depths of humankind in the mind-body connection. And he's probably one of the more interesting speakers in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Gabor Mate to its rainmaking time. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. The first thing I wanted to tell you was my sincere thank you for writing this book that we're going to discuss today, When the Body Says No, Exploring the Stress-Disease Connection, because even though many of us today who consider ourselves on the cutting edge are really paying attention to the mind-body relationship, the profound amount of evidence in this book that you cite and the way you explain the disease and the body connection as it relates to the emotions is profound. And I'd like to just read a small portion of your book. On page 28, Sile actually wrote this. He said, stress is not simply nervous tension. Stress reactions do occur in lower animals and even in plants that have no nervous systems. Indeed, stress can be produced under deep anesthesia in patients who are unconscious and even in cell cultures grown outside the body. There is a way to feel tension without activating the psychological mechanisms of stress. So apparently, stress can be triggered by emotional trauma or just the threat of such trauma, even if purely imaginary. Tell us more what we need to know about emotionality and how it's a causal factor in stress? Well, um, stress is a physiological reaction in the body, so that's the first thing to understand. So usually when people think of stress, they think of um, something that bothers them. And, you know, there's some truth to that, but from the scientific point of view, that's not what we mean by stress. From, From the scientific perspective, stress is a physiological reaction in your body that is triggered by usually fear, and then it moves into a set of responses that would help you deal with the fear. So uh, adrenaline and cortisol are the two stress hormones. They elevate the blood pressure, make your muscles stronger, increase your heartbeat, uh, elevate your sugar level. In other words, helping your body prepare to escape or to fight. So the, so the stress response is that physiological flight or fight mechanism that occurs. Now, the question is what triggers that response. Well, any, any sense of threat of losing something that you consider important. So what are people stressed by? Well, a threat to their lives, a threat to their children, a threat to their emotional relationships, a threat to the sense of being loved, a threat to their jobs. Any one of these things can trigger the stress response. We need the stress response in order to, do, to deal with acute threats, but in the long-term stress, it actually damages the body. So in the short term, it's helpful. But chronic stress is that damaging. So the same chemicals, cortisol and adrenaline, for example, in the short term, help you escape or to fight back. In the long term, damage your heart, give you high blood pressure, uh, can cause strokes, uh, ulcers in the intestines, depression, suppress your immune system, thin your bones, and cause a whole other set of deleterious effects. So we have to distinguish between chronic stress and acute stress. Acute stress is the response, specific response to the threat. Chronic stress is what happens when people unwittingly take on too much or there's too much stress in their lives and they have no way of dealing with it in a powerful, self-assertive way. That chronic stress underlines much of what we call illness in our society, much of what is illness in our society. And that chronic stress is not seen by people very clearly because they're so used to it, they think it's normal. So a lot of people are much more stressed than they think they are simply because they don't recognize it as stress anymore. Why do you think it is that we're able to 
adapt to it almost like the frog adapts to boiling water and by the time it's fully adapted it's cooked why is it that we are not conscious of this as it's happening that goes back to childhood you see in childhood uh, we have two great needs the first and the overriding need is attachment to our parents to the nurturing adults in our lives without that we don't survive so that need overrides everything else the second need that all human beings have at any stage is to be is authenticity, to be authentically themselves. In other words, to feel what they feel, to be able to express what they feel, and to have that received and understood by the environment and responded to. So far, so good. But what happens in a child's life when, in order to maintain the attachment relationship, they have to suppress who they are? Because the parents can't handle it. Because the parents are too needy. Because the parents are too threatened by the child's anger because the parents are so stressed and distracted that the child learns to suppress their own needs in order to fit in with the parenting relationship, because that's the primary need. So in other words, the one need then for attachment trumps the other one for authenticity. And we lose touch with our bodies and our emotions. And therefore, we're no longer aware when we're stressed. And that becomes our personality. So it's not a question of a choice anybody makes. Really, it's the consequence of stresses in our nurturing environment, which we adapt to, but we adapt to it by suppressing ourselves. I like the part in here where you say, physiologically, emotions are themselves electrical, chemical, and hormonal discharges of the human nervous system. Emotions influence and are influenced by the functioning of our major organs, the integrity of our immune defenses, and the workings of the many circulating biological substances that help govern the body's physical states. You talk about what happens when emotions are repressed. I also thought it was profound that none of your patients with serious diseases have learned to say no. This is profound. Well, it, it, my whole thesis is that, well, first of all, all, the quote that you just read out, all that means to say is that mind and body can't be separated and that the emotions are not separate from the body. So that whatever we experience emotionally, we also experience physiologically by definition. And uh, that's obvious because if you experienced a powerful emotion right now, you could actually notice your body changing in a moment. I mean, blood might rush to your face, you might blush. Blood might leave your internal organs. Your intestine might start cramping. Any number of physiological things would happen. Now, whether you're physically aware that things are happening, they're still happening. So whenever there's emotion, there's also emotional, uh, there's a physiological reaction. And uh, now when people learn to suppress their emotions, because that's what their parenting environment demands, that doesn't mean they stop reacting physically. It just means that they lose uh, contact with that reaction and can no longer respond in a healthy way to it. Now, the difficulty saying no comes out of the parental need for the child to be always compliant or to the child or for the child to take care of the parent. So then we develop this personality that we never disappoint anybody, we're always dutiful, we're always um, responsible, and we never say no. And my contention is that when we don't know how to say no, the body will say it. That's the, the title of the book, when the body says no. And no matter, no matter whether you look at people with cancer or <clears throat> multiple sclerosis, ALS, colitis, Crohn's disease, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, um, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic psoriasis, eczema, the patterns are typically people who take on too much, who have difficulty saying no in important areas of their lives, and then the body ends up saying no for them. The body is so intelligent, and even more clearly so in reading your book. The body's got extreme intelligence about it, and that's just the whole tragedy of modern medicine, because when people come to a doctor who, like me, you know, is a medical doctor trained in Western medical ways, we're trained to take people's symptoms away from them or to suppress their diseases. Now, that's not a bad thing in itself, but we never learn to interpret the diseases. In other words, we never ask the person to consider what is the disease saying to you? What are the actual measures here? So while it's legitimate to want to cure a disease or to um, alleviate a, a troublesome symptom, what is not legitimate is to ignore the message at the same time because it's the body's way of telling us something that we haven't paying attention to. 
And so modern medicine is very good 